However, finding differences in an infant sibling group as a whole does not necessarily mean that we have found um, an early predictor of autism. This is a fact that was brought home very clearly to me in studies from our own laboratory, in which a graduate student, Noah Marin, carried out a study looking at six-month-old infants' responses to the still face situation. As you probably all know, the still face situation involves the baby watching the mother as the mother smiles and talks, and then the mother becomes still for a minute, and then the mother smiles and talks to the baby again and for another minute. Noah conducted this study using eye tracking methodology and the method of two videos, mother on one video, baby on the other video, talking to each other in real time so that we could look at the baby's eye movements as the baby studied the mother's face. Um, would you show the video, please? Here's just a little sample. So the dot is where the baby is looking, and the size of the dot tells you the duration of the baby's gaze. This is a typically developing six-month-old. He's from the low-risk group. And what we see is that the baby is quite happy, engaged with his mother, and spending a lot of time looking in her eyes. Here's the still episode. It's okay, he's not gonna cry. <laughs> but we see the expected changes in baby affect, and then the baby starts to look away from the mother's face, probably as a way of avoiding that unusual stimulation of a mother with an unresponsive face. <coughs> and then as the mother comes back on again, <laughs> thank you, you can stop the video. Okay. So that's the paradigm. The mother sees the baby on one screen, the baby sees the mother on the other, and we can follow the baby's eye movements. We carried this out expecting to find differences in the emotional expressions of the babies who had a sibling with autism and expecting to find differences in their patterns of gaze to the mother's eyes and face due, um, due to the previous science by Ami Klin and the Yale group. And what we found was that the children in the high-risk group who had a brother or sister with autism did show a higher proportion of preference for the mother's mouth than did the children who were from the lowest group. So, so this shows the top of these boxes shows preference for the eyes, the bottom of the boxes shows preference for the mouth. And so we anticipated a greater preference for mouths, uh, and that is what we saw. So the next question is then, is this associated with the presence of autism? It's an abnormality in this group as a whole. Does it predict autism? The children in, this, in red are the children who developed autism. As you can see, the three children who developed autism spend 100, essentially 100% 100 of their time looking at eyes. And of the children who preferred looking at mouths, almost none of them have atypical development. These two have developmental delays. This child, the only child in the typical group to 100% of the time watched her mother's mouth, was completely normally developing. <coughs> so uh, Greg Young followed this up to see what does preference for the mouth uh, predict. And this graph demonstrates that preference for the mouth is associated with better language function by the age of three. It happens both in standardized testing, these are the group who spent the most time looking at the mouth, and it also, uh, we found this with mother's reports of vocabulary, understanding, and production. In fact, mouth looking probably connotes infants who are more sensitive at this point in development to the correspondence between voice 
mouth movements and what they're hearing. So even though the at-risk group shows this elevated sign, it's not associated with autism, and it's actually associated with better language outcomes, which are the opposite of what we were expecting. Uh, so this, I think, it, Deb, we'll come back to this point. Anyway, so when we uh, do the infant sibling work, what model is it that we're thinking about in terms of how autism develops? And I think this early detection work is really um, underlying it is a fairly biological way of understanding autism. This is a model from the work of Uta Frith and Morton, a 1992 paper, in which uh, they offered a variety of different models that might explain or be useful for understanding developmental disorders. And this model suggests that there is a biological substrate which is abnormal in ASD, that this biological substrate leads to abnormal brain conditions, the abnormal brain structures create poorly functioning brain systems, and the abnormal brain systems lead to aberrant behaviors, which is the symptom level or the behavioral level of autism. And I think in the infant detection work, this model is very much at play. We are, expect that the babies will reflect the biology of autism in their behavior through this straightforward path as early as one month or three months or as soon as we can get it. I think that's what the model is, is what we're expecting. However, there's another way of thinking about autism, and the model that I have up here is the transactional model of development, which is the, I think, most widely accepted model of development for typical development. In a transactional model, we assume that biology and experience are constantly influencing each other, that it, this is not an additive process, but a constantly transforming process in which bi uh, biology, the organismic biological level of autism, does have impact on brain development, and that the social environment and all the experiences of the baby also influence brain development, and these together influence the, the development of brain systems and behavior patterns, which are reflected in behavior, and that children's behavior affects the social environment which affects brain development, which affects brain systems, which affects behavior, and that this is an ongoing and ever-changing process uh, in which the transactional effects are present at least from the time of birth, and many would argue are present from well before the time of birth, since there are environmental influences on fetal development as well. Is there support for this kind of transactional model in autism? Yes, there's, there is growing support for the idea that the experiences in the environment of the young child with autism are having ongoing effects on brain systems and outcomes. One piece of evidence has to do with what I just showed you, this decelerating developmental rate over time, over the first three years of time in autism, in children who are not regressing, but are continuing to move forward, but in a slower rate. A second piece of evidence involves the massive improvements that some young children show after intensive early intervention. And I doubt that there's anyone in this room who is not familiar with some of the studies that show dramatic increases, including normalization of behavior and cognitive abilities, after several years of very intensive intervention, and also for some children without that kind of intervention. Um, a third piece of evidence has to do with the, the, those studies that have demonstrated a better treatment response in younger children than in older children. And in fact, Lobos described this in his very first early intervention study. It was due to his failure to make long-term changes in older children that took him down to two-year-olds uh, were the first group of his landmark 1987 study. Another piece of evidence has recently come from Michael Siller and Marion Sigmund's lab, in which they demonstrated that parent-child interaction 
patterns in the first few years of life, predicted language development and language abilities in the later part of adolescence, and that the variability explained by parent, the parent's style of following children's leads and following their attention, those changes were independent of IQ, original language level, or any or severity of autism. So this is a profound effect of early, subtle differences in interaction style, which are carrying on over 15, 16 years, and are still in place even after years of education, intervention, and all kinds of other experiences. This is exactly what a transactional model would suggest. Small differences early on create larger and larger differences over time. Um, however, I want, there's a mystery to this for the developmental psychologists in the room that I have to point out, which is that no developmental pattern really fits this model of onset, of the kind of the beginning foundations in dyadic social reciprocal interaction which somehow disappear and have to start over again. We don't have another disorder that I'm aware of in which this is a developmental pattern. However, once children kind of go through the onset phase and are moving kind of into autism, they start to develop again and their progress fits very normal developmental steps once progress begins again in language, in play, in motor development. It's, it's fascinating to at least me.